if you turn to the book of Jude tonight, we are, uh, if, you, if you stop and think, uh, really, all the things that the Bible says about heaven, the question you have to ask about the new heaven, and we're not going to talk about the new heaven tonight, but I want to say that, but you, sh you, should, you should get that book on heaven. There may be some things that you don't agree with. Of course, I don't agree with everything I read or everything I write, but if you stop and think about, for example, the new Jerusalem, there are multitudes of people who say, well, that's not real, that it is just figurative. Uh, and I'm not a Thomas Aquinas fan, but Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas said that in heaven, There'll, there'll be no, there'll be nothing. We'll be simply contemplative in heaven. That there'll never be anything really to do in heaven. But that isn't really what the Bible says. The Bible talks about the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, the new earth is going to be the new earth. It's going to be the earth with a curse removed. And so why, why wouldn't? The Bible says we're going to rule and reign with Christ. The Bible repeatedly says we're going to rule here on the earth. Why would we take that in a figurative sense? Why would we take when it says the new Jerusalem is 1,500 miles in a cube or a pyramid, why would we not take that literally? Uh, there are just so many things that the Bible says, people really don't want to take them. Again, well, heaven, the new Jerusalem, that's not really a real place. Why would there really, they're not, Really, there are not really streets of gold. That's what they'll tell you. There are not really gates of pearl. But why would we not take the Bible in a literal sense? Uh, I know people. I read, I read about a guy today. He said that his entire belief of the New Testament before he was saved was, that the four Gospels, none of it was real. That it was all an allegory. That nothing that happened in the four Gospels actually happened. You say, preacher, are there really people like that? Yes, there are really people who believe that. I have come to the conclusion that one of my brothers basically believes that almost the entire Bible is an allegory. You say, well, what does that mean? An allegory simply means that what it says is not what it means. The New Jerusalem is not a place that is divided four square. Uh, Jesus did not really walk on the water. He did not literally feed 5,000 with some bread and fish. Uh, David was not real. The first time I mentioned to my brother, I said, you know that some people do not believe that David was real, that he was a real guy. And there are multitudes of people who would say that they, King David was not real that he was a made-up, mythological, he-man figure that the Jews made up, that he did not really exist. And the first time I said that to my brother, he goes, yeah, there are some people who don't believe that, uh, that David was real. Well, after talking with him, and I heard him say this, I, I heard him say it, that the entire Bible is an allegory, that it does not really mean what it says. And when the Bible says that God has given us all things to richly enjoy, that we're going to rule and reign here on earth, it does not really mean that. But why should we not take the Bible literally? If we cannot take Jesus saves literally, if we cannot take John 3.16 literally, uh, then what's the use really of having a Bible. But you should get that book. It's by Randy Alcorn. It's called Heaven. It's got things in it that I, I, I've read it. It's got things in it I've never really considered uh, before uh, about heaven uh, and about the new Jerusalem and about what I believe is, is I believe is rapidly approaching. I believe that it is. Well, Jude, Let's stand tonight, shall we? We'll begin reading in Jude uh, tonight.
for a few minutes. Thank you for coming again. Uh, I personally will be, uh, my wife said to me, you shouldn't wish your life away. I know I shouldn't. At this point, you don't have a lot of wishes left, you know, but it's like, uh, I sure wish spring was here, you know, but uh, sooner or later. We will start in verse 15. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them all, their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Again, I, I, I say to you, I, I, I literally saw the guy carrying a sign. When Jesus comes back, let's kill him again. I mean, that is just absolutely, that is what Jude is speaking about in verse 15. Ungodly people. You say, preacher, that's horrible. Well, you're right, it is. But that's what ungodly sinners are. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. And their mouth speaking great, swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, keeping faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior. Note that, to the only wise God, our Savior. God said in Isaiah, I believe it's 42, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Kind of shoots a hole in the Jehovah's Witnesses that say that Jesus is not God. To the only wise God, our Savior, to be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, bless it. We pray to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us. Lord, as we, Lord, kind of right in the middle of a winter and Lord, it's cold. Lord, things have not gone particularly as we would hope they would. And Lord, we know that all things work together for good. So Lord, we'll rejoice in that. We, we, we surely don't understand why things happen the way that they do sometimes. I know I don't. Lord, I... I sometimes I look and say, well, Lord, you could have stopped that. You could have stopped that. But you didn't, didn't stop it. So, Lord, there must be some reason for why you allow things to happen, Lord. Why the last two Sundays, Lord, have been the, two of the coldest days uh, that we've experienced in a long time. Lord, why didn't it happen during the middle of the week? Lord, we don't know. But Lord, we know that you know. Lord, we know that you know. And so, Lord, we'll leave that with you. Lord, I pray you'll help us tonight. Encourage us, Lord, as I said. Lord, here we are. Lord, the second Sunday of January. And it's cold. And you can't really get outside and work in your garden. And Cut your grass. Lord, not much you can do outside. So, Lord, help us. We pray tonight that tonight you would encourage us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. It's, I, I think particularly the snow came off the roof on this side. 
uh, it came off on this side. And, boy, you wouldn't want to have been standing there when it came off on that side, uh, either side. This side it came off and took the railing down on that, that porch over there, uh, took the, the roof kind of caved in over there on that, that woodshed. Somebody said, well, it's your own fault. You didn't have wood stacked in it. Well, maybe, but, you know, it's like then the porch, you know, uh, uh, an atomic bomb came through that. And so it's like, you know, it, you say, well, boy, preacher, that's the way it is. I guess so. And Jude, verse 22, and of some have compassion, making a difference. On some have compassion, making a difference. Most of us will never, m none of us will ever be Charles Spurgeon. Now, I, I, I have some of Spurgeon's books, and Spurgeon is pretty hard to read. I know that there are many people who say, well, Spurgeon was a great preacher, and he, and he was a great preacher. Thousands came out to see Spurgeon preach and to hear him. Uh, Spurgeon was somewhat in, inconsistent in his life as far as his Calvinism was concerned. Uh, he claimed to be a Calvinist, yet that Spurgeon was one of the most evangelistic men that you would ever meet. Spurgeon had men sitting on his platform that he called his hounds that would sit on his platform and look for people in his congregation as he preached that were under great conviction. And when Spurgeon would give an invitation, which he would, they would go out during the invitation and try and reach these people with the gospel of Christ. Most of us will never be a Spurgeon. None of us. I, I would dare say none of us would ever be a Spurgeon. Most of us, none of us will ever be a D.L. Moody. It is estimated that Moody won a million people to Christ in his life. Again, people will say this. Well, do you think they were all real? Well, how do I know if they were all real? But at least Moody had the opportunity to preach to millions of people. All across the world, most of us, none of us, will be able to do that. Although, having said that, we, our ministry here, which is, again, amazing uh, to me that God would use us. And <clears throat> if we could ever get hooked up with uh, whatever our Internet company is, we can, we can start broadcasting our program live on Facebook every Sunday, we can start doing that. Um, now, you know, it's just one more opportunity. But most of we'll, we'll never be DL Moody. When, when people say uh, Calvary Bible Church, most people, where's that? Well, it's in Greg, New York. Well, where in the world is Greg, New York? You know, it's like, where is it? Mo most of us. If you, say, if you say DL Moody, you immediately think of uh, Northfield. You immediately think of Moody's Church uh, in Chicago. Um, you immediately, I think of Moody. Uh, Moody had the first uh, bus ministry, which he used to take wagons, horses, and wagons around Chicago and pick up little boys and girls and bring them to Sunday school. We'll, we'll, we'll probably never, we'll probably never, unless God does something miraculous, we'll probably never be mentioned with D.L. Moody. We'll probably never be mentioned with Billy Sunday. I have, seen, I have seen videos, they're really old videos and kind of rough, but of Moody preaching, I mean of Billy Sunday preaching. Um, of course, Billy Sunday's big thing was alcohol. He was so, so against it. But we'll probably never have international fame like Billy Sunday or William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army. Uh, Booth was a Methodist, and he had a local preacher's license and uh, he wanted to get ordained, and uh, he went to the meeting to be ordained and uh, to get his preacher's license, and, and they refused to ordain him. And, of course, he was discouraged when he came home, and his wife came out the door to meet him. Of course, she was all excited, happy about the fact that uh, he had gone down to be ordained, and she said, what happened? what they say? what they do? And he just looked at her and said, well, it looks like it's just going to be us and God here the rest of the way out. 
And of course, Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army, not like we know it is today. I mean, the Salvation Army is so far removed from what William Booth did uh, when he found it. Most of us will never be Hudson Taylor or Adoram Judson. Most of us will never be evangelists like Sam Jones. I, I had the opportunity to preach uh, for my brother in Mississippi one time, and we went out to somebody's house uh, for lunch one day, and, and she pointed to a tree out there, and there was a mark on the tree. And she said that is where a flood was that occurred uh, the year Sam Jones came here and preached. Now, Sam Jones, of course, has been dead a long time. Sam Jones was that lawyer from Cartersville, Georgia. You'll remember his testimony. He was a lawyer. He was a drunk. Uh, he, according to what I've read, according to what I heard, Sam Jones got drunk one night in the bar. They threw him out the back door. He puked up all over himself. The frost was on him. He got up, walked back in in the morning, looked in the mirror of the bar and said, my God, is that Sam Jones? From that point on, God did something in his life. He got saved. He went down and he borrowed money to buy a new suit of clothes. He went home and told his wife, who had been praying for him, uh, to uh, get saved, to have his life changed. He went in and told his wife he was a new man. Most of us will never experience the ministry of, of seeing hundreds, yea, thousands of people um, come to Christ because of our ministry. I mean, we're just, we're here in Greg, New York. But that isn't what Jude writes to us here. He says in verse, that verse, but ye, beloved, verse 20, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, praying. Prayer today has been relegated to the position of obscurity, that it doesn't really work. But that's not what Jude says. Keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Unto eternal life. And this is what he says. This is what he says to us. And of some have compassion. Some. Now, we'll never be Spurgeon, the prince of preachers. It's amazing. I believe Spurgeon died when he was 58. Spurgeon had a lot of health problems. He, had, he, had, he suffered from, people say, well, nobody should ever be discouraged. Spurgeon suffered from great periods of depression in his life. He would have to leave England. He would go to France and stay there. Uh, because of these great periods of depression. Uh, some uh, attributed to the fact that one night someone yelled fire uh, in his church and uh, people were killed that night, uh, not because of a fire, but because of people trampled one another uh, trying to get out the door. Uh, we, we talked about that in our, our little meeting today about you know fire drill and, and what we're going to do. Some attributed Spurgeon's depression to that. Most of us will never be a Spurgeon and will never be a Moody or a, or a Bob Jones Sr. Bob Jones Sr. was a famous evangelist in the South and he was a Methodist of all things. Uh, Billy Sunday was a Presbyterian. J. Wilbur Chapman who wrote One Day was a Presbyterian. D.L. Moody was a Congregationalist. Uh, we'll never be them. We will never be them. But Jude says this, on some, have compassion. On some. See, what was it about Spurgeon? I have this, oh, I did have it written. I have it written in one of my other Bibles. Um, Spurgeon said this, it's one of my other Bibles, if the damned be lost, let not them go to hell with our, without our arms wrapped around their legs imploring them not to go. If the damned be lost, 
let not one of them go there unprayed for. We can do that. I know that the Calvinists, and man, we've had some of them come here, man, and they love Spurgeon. Uh, you know, Spurgeon made this the comment, uh, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man are like two train tracks that somewhere in eternity will eventually meet. I don't believe that's true. Uh, but, uh, but we can have the compassion of Spurgeon. We can do that. We may not be, and I, supposedly, D.L. Moody was, if you, you read things that he wrote, and I, I have a, someone lent me a copy of his Bible, I, I don't even know where, what it was, I, something of his, and you know, his spelling is pitiful, sentence structure is not that great, but he had compassion. Yeah, compassion on bump people. Moody said this. I read that he said this. Whether it was true or not, I'll just take it that it was. Moody determined in his life that he would never go to bed at night unless he had, had witnessed to one person in his life every day. And he went to bed one night and he realized he had not. And he got up, went out on the street, met somebody, and witnessed to him about Christ. See, on some have compassion. Have compassion. And as Jude says this about it, that'll make a difference on some people. On some people, just loving them will make a difference. I realize there are some hard nuts to crack out there, and there are some guys that, you know, probably will never get saved. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes it very clear that, that comparatively speaking, of, of the billions of people in the world, relatively few get saved. That's a hard thing. And I may not be Spurgeon, and I may not be Moody, and I may not be Billy Sunday, and I may not be Hudson Taylor, Adam Brian Judson. I may not be Sam Jones. But I can have compassion. I can love people. I can outwardly show the love of Christ. And I ask you tonight that. I, Brethren, here we are, it's January, you know, there's not a whole lot going on, it's hard to get out, it's cold, you want to go somewhere? What is it we ask God this year? What can we ask for God? Want from God, expect from God, pray, as Jude says, praying in the Holy Ghost. What is it that you and I need? What do we need? Well, there are a lot of things, and we don't have time for all that, but what is one thing that we need? We need the compassion of Christ. One of my brothers, and, you know, I, I love my brothers. I, I dearly love my brothers. I think, you know, they're wrong. You know the worst thing about, they said about Jesus? You'll remember this. The worst thing they said about Jesus is that he eats with sinners in public. He eats with them. Can you imagine that? My brother says, well, I don't like being around lost people. Now, I know lost people are going to do what lost people do. I know that. Lost people talk. You know, that, that's why about the president. Look, that's, that's the way the president talks. That's the way he talks. You know, and that's what I expect. That's what I expect out of him. That's what I get. But my brother says, well, I don't want to be around lost people because they use bad language. Well, yeah, lost people do use bad language. But Jesus was around those people every day. You think that people didn't use bad language about it around him? But Jesus, that song we sing, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. The Bible says that when he, he was moved, and here's this word, compassion. He was moved with compassion. Compassion is not only feeling sorry for somebody. I can feel sorry for you. You know, you got a flat tire and it's, you know, 20 below and you got a flat tire. Boy, I feel sorry for you. You don't have a jack. Boy, I feel sorry for you. You don't even have a spare tire. That's even worse. And you don't even have a blanket to stay warm in the car. I'm sorry for you, but that's not compassion. Jesus moved with compassion. 
Compassion is not only feeling sorry for a person, but having the ability to do something about it. Jesus could do that. When that leper man came to Jesus, he said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. And the Bible says he was moved to compassion and reached forth, and he touched him and said, I will be thou. That is compassion. Jesus, or Jude writes here, and on some have compassion. Making a difference. Doesn't say on some have sympathy. That guy I told you about that I saw carrying that sign. If Jesus comes back, let's kill him again. I, 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 initially, I, I tell you that that kind of thing makes my blood boil. I like to meet that guy. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Stop and think about that guy for a minute. You stop and think about that guy when he stands before Jesus. The Bible says have compassion. That means not only do I feel sorry for people, but I have the ability to do something to help them. That would make the difference. Are we going to win everybody? Of course not. Of course we aren't. But the Bible says that we ought to have compassion, compassion on our, our friends. Now, most of you have friends who say, well, most of my friends are in church, and that probably is so, and that, you know, is probably rightfully so. You hang around lost people long enough, pretty soon you start acting like lost people. But, but you know, do you have a lost friend? My brother is somewhat amazed that I have friends that are lost. People that I went to high school with, basically most of them are lost, not all of them. But I still consider them my friends. I still see them. I still talk to them. I still associate with them. Do I do what they do? Well, no, I don't. But I, I want to have compassion upon them. I want to have the love of Christ toward them, toward my relations. How many of you have somebody in your family, you think about this tonight, they're lost. They're lost. Almost everybody, I, I, think, I, I believe my cousin Elaine is saved. Now, she's not our flavor, but I believe that she is saved. I believe her husband's saved. I believe that they are. I believe my brothers are saved. I believe they are. I believe my boys are saved. I believe they are. But my immediate family, other than that, most of my cousins aren't saved on both sides of my family. Well, thank God some of them are, but let's have some compassion. We can make a difference. People that we work with. I've invited, I've invited one guy to church several times. I've invited a couple people several times. One guy I invite all the time. You know, I'm not coming to your church. Blah, blah. He gives me every excuse in the world. But I've started working on another guy. I don't browbeat him with the Bible. I don't beat him over the head with Scripture. I try to be nice to him. I try to be friendly to him. I'll open the door for him. I'll open the garage door for him. I'll wash the back of his bus off for him. On some, have compassion. Making a difference. You think you'll ever reach a preacher? I don't know, but I'm not going to stop trying. Hell is so long, and eternity is so long. And people are going to go there. The Bible says on some have compassion, making, making a difference. Dr. Bob Jones, I forget who wrote the book, Builder of Bridges. But Dr. Bob, one of Dr. Bob's favorite poems was that poem, Builder of Bridges. An old man traveling a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. That sullen stream held no fear for him but turned when he reached the other side and built the bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your time building here. Your journey will end with a passing of day, and you never again will come this way. You've crossed this chasm deep and wide. Why well, build you this bridge at eventide? The builder lifted his old gray head 
and said, Good friend, there cometh after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm which has been naught to me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. On some, have compassion, making a difference. Now, there'll be some other people, and the next verse says, some you got to pull out of the fire with fear. Friend, you're going to hell and be a big greasy spot. Now, you need to be careful, you know, how you talk to people. You're going to wind up being a greasy spot in hell if you don't get saved. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that that does a lot, but we need to warn people that there is a, a hell. But with some, having compassion this year, this year, will make a difference. I'm not a, you know this, I am not a time setter, a date setter in any way. I do not know when Jesus is going to come. Of course, I believe in the imminent return, which I believe he could come before we get out of here in just a couple minutes. But I have, a, I have an idea that Jesus may be closer than we believe. And if we're going to reach some, we better have some compassion because that will make the difference in whether they go to heaven or not. Father, we thank you again. Lord, tonight, for your word. Lord, just a simple verse. So in some, have compassion, making a difference. Lord, we are that builder of bridges. Lord, I, I pray that you'll help us. Lord, we can make a difference. Not only can we feel sorry for people, Lord, but we have the ability to do something to help them out. We have the truth. We know that we are of the truth. And the truth will set us free. Lord, I, I ask that you'll help us, Lord, this year, this year, to have compassion, to love people, and thereby making a difference. Lord, I think tonight of my dad. I do not believe there was ever a contractor that came out to the job that dad did not witness to. He never Billy Sunday or Charles Spurgeon or D.L. Moody. But he had compassion upon people. Lord, I'm ashamed sometimes when I think about that. Oh God, I pray. Help us to have compassion upon people. To love people. To show that we love people, not by word, but by deed and action, we pray. Father, I pray you'll give traveling mercy tonight. I ask you to watch over us as we go home. Uh, Lord, keep us safe. I know I don't have far to go, but Lord, uh, people have to travel round about to get where they're going. So Lord, just watch over them, we pray. Thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace to us. Lord, it is of your mercy that we are not consumed. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy tonight. How great is that mercy? Oh, God, how great is that mercy tonight to us? God bless us, we ask again. Bring us back Wednesday, we pray. Give us a good week. Lord, I pray next Sunday be a... Lord, every, every day is a good day. It's a day that you've made, but maybe the weather be just a little bit warmer. Lord, help us this week. To have compassion upon people, we pray. Bless we ask now as we go. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.